After a year of slavery, an infamous teenage assassin is given the chance to become the tyrannical king's personal assassin. This is the podcast that gets lit, episode one. I thought we were doing a countdown. <laughs> I fully missed all of that. Welcome to the podcast that gets lit, episode one. Yeah. <laughs> We're off to a great start hey. here. We, we we tried to live stream for you guys. Strong effort made. <laughs> we are on location in San Francisco, not yes. related to the book at all, because no. the book doesn't take place in San Francisco. It doesn't even take place in America. But we're in the same room, which is going to be a bit uncommon for the first several episodes. Yes. But, so. Cheers Ooh. to that. Cheers to that. So, uh, tell me, Luke, what are we drinking tonight? We have a couple of things to drink. Uh, the one I'm probably, I don't know, I'm excited about all of them, really. <laughs> I, we have three really awesome options. We this, do. This is a, what would you, so this is your Bravura, uh, membership. Membership, uh, at Bravery Brewing in Bravery Lancaster, Brewing. California. And this beer is called The Shroud. It's a stout that's made with, Five different types of vanilla beans from all over the world. That was pretty cool. I know there's some Madagascar in there and some other things. So it's really good. We had it, we <laughs> it, had it, really we had it the other day. It's quite good. Um, and one that when we got here to San Francisco today, we stopped by BevMo and uh, found Dragon's Milk White. I've had Dragon's Milk by New Holland Brewery out of uh, Michigan, I believe. Uh, yep. Holland, Michigan. Uh, but Bailey spotted the white dragon's milk, and I was like, that's probably something we should go with. That definitely uh, sounds like something we should try. <laughs> yeah. So, what are we doing here? Today, today we are talking about uh, Throne of Glass by Sarah J. Mass. It was published on August 2nd, 2012. So, uh, it's coming up there on the on its age. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a cheeky eight year old, right? <laughs> At this point. Yeah, absolutely. And Cheeky is a perfect way to describe our main character. Yeah. she She's sassy. She's got some sass to her, <laughs> that is for sure. That's Selena Sardafian. Exactly. Right? Apparently some people call her Kaylena, which seems odd to me. Well, but I, okay. Because it's a C to start it with. But yeah, Well, they're wrong. I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it is 406 pages or 12 hours and 47 minutes if you're listening which we both have right i think i, I put it in through both the page <laughs> i feel like page numbers are becoming less and less useful over time i, I mean I, I would say 80 percent of the books i read in a year are audiobooks mm -hmm. so and i mean even page numbers it varies between the physical copy the exactly. ebook copy paperback hard bag you really have to versions. be specific on yeah. This is the hardback edition. Is right. in my edition. Pages. It's like, well, great. What does that mean? But even audiobooks can be misleading on time mm -hmm. too, right? Because some readers are quicker, some readers are slower. And well, and some audiobooks have half an hour bonus content at like the this end. One. Exactly. And it really did. We finished listening to it again on the car ride up here, and it was like, oh, it still has half an hour left. Nope. Yeah. Time for some bonus yeah, content. We were driving up, and we were about, I'd say, halfway. Close to halfway between Lancaster, California, and San Francisco, California, and there was like an hour and a half left. I know because you had checked the time, and mm -hmm. I was like, "Oh, okay, that's that's gonna be pretty good." It was like forty minutes later, the book was no. over. <laughs> was like, oh, Granted, okay. we were listening on one point seven five speed, but, yeah, but still. still, but still, I just listened to the entire book the other day and totally forgot they go into the next, the first three chapters of book two. I had already forgotten. <laughs> but, <laughs> So We're not yes. talking about books. <laughs> Pages and time length are kind of irrelevant in some aspects. A little bit. A little bit. Uh, the dedication in this book is to all my readers from Fiction Press for being with me at the beginning and staying long after the end. Thank you for everything. Well, that's nice. Yeah. So, I don't. You, you're much. You're much more familiar with Sarah's work than I am. This is her first published novel. 
I believe so. It's absolutely the first one I read, mm-hmm. and I I think that this is actually her first published novel. I, the, Especially going off this dedication, I'm thinking that she had not necessarily fan fiction, but just some Less, smaller things. More amateur Exactly, that efforts. she was publishing online mm-hmm. and people urged her to publish something amazing. And she, I think you told me that she started as writing fanfic for um, Twilight series? Is that right? Or am I confusing no. that with something else? That is... Um... Oh, that's Fifty Shades of Grey. Completely yes. different. Fifty Shades Never of mind. Grey is a Twilight fan fiction. Okay. For more on that, <laughs> not on, we will not be talking about it. Not with me, at least. <laughs> that's not one I'm putting on my short list. <laughs> but we have a lot more to talk about this book, but we do have all of the books we're planning on doing this year. This is our boozy book club, monthly book club. So we hope you join us. And in the description of this video below is a link to show all 12 books that we're doing this year. So check them out. There's going to be links to where you can buy them and help support us. We truly appreciate that. And it should give you a little time to go through the the books if yeah, you haven't be, read them Yeah, be before. prepared to kind of listen along with us and share your thoughts with us in the chat. Absolutely. When we finally get to when live streaming. <laughs> hopefully is an anomaly that we're not live streaming. We <sighs> truly tried. Um, the Wi-Fi gods are just against us tonight but that's okay it happens we have a whole book to talk about <laughs> we absolutely do let's start with the goodreads synopsis i want to start with this too. Uh, you you do, you do some pouring i will do some reading and this is tiny so bear with me after serving out a year of hard labor in the salt mines of endovia for her crimes 18 year old assassin selena sardothian is dragged before the crown prince prince dorian offers her her freedom on one condition She must act as his champion in a competition to find a new royal assassin. Her opponents are men thieves and assassins and warriors from across the empire, each sponsored by a member of the king's council. If she beats her opponents in a series of eliminations, she'll serve for the kingdom for four years and then be granted her freedom. Selena finds her training sessions with the captain of the guard, Westfall, challenging and exhilarating but she's bored stiff by court life. Things get a little more interesting when the prince starts to show an interest in her, but it's the gruff Captain Westfall who seems to understand her best. Then one of the other contestants turns up dead, quickly followed by another. Can Selena figure out who the killer is before she becomes a victim? As the young assassin investigates, her search leads her to discover a greater destiny than she could possibly have imagined. All right. So, that's obviously a quick recap summary. I guess that's supposed to be a teaser into it as well as it's... It's a a true synopsis. It's supposed to be a teaser, but honestly, it feels like it covers a lot of the book. Yeah. I feel like... So, in preparing for this, I did some searching around, and I realized a lot of different places that you can find information on books, they have different, like, cover synopses, which was odd. And I also found it odd that the one that I originally found gave some information that I feel like wasn't covered in the book. It potentially could be a spoiler (laughs) moving forward. I I just thought it was a little weird how many different versions. I mean, there's the Goodreads version, which in general, we're going to try to follow Goodreads as our baseline on things. I think it's just a safe middle ground, easy for anyone to get. If you don't have a Goodreads account, get one. It's great. You can set your friend us. Friend us. Search our names on there. Yep, absolutely. Um, But I found one where it was saying that she eventually gets help from her ancestors. And I'm like, that is certainly not covered in the book. (laughs) Yeah, that's absolutely (laughs) not. Or someone just wasn't paying attention and made an assumption. So it's either a spoiler or someone is just wrong, which is the the internet, right? You'll have to wait and find out. I'll have to wait and find out. I have read the entire series. Yeah, I've read only this this first book. fingers crossed i will not spoil anything but i make no guarantees well we i'm not lot. i'm not as practiced as luke in the avoiding <laughs> of the spoilers well cheers it's difficult so there's a lot of ways you can try to chop up a book in a one-ish hour chat right mm-hmm. again we've got 12 hours of audio time plus to talk about a lot of characters, there's a lot of storylines that gets pretty intricate. I 
I kind of chopped up what I viewed as the top themes overall. Um, mm-hmm. So what what's our first what's our first theme? Our first theme: survival and freedom. Okay, so to me, obviously, Selena Sardapian, Assassin Queen, Queen of the Underworld is what they call her every now and then, which <laughs> we'll get to whether or not that's warranted at all. But um, she clearly is given being given this chance to go into this competition on behalf of Prince Dorian, who has to find a champion to go into this competition for her his father. So she's she's in this thing fighting for her life. I mean, or else she's going back to Andovir, which is a mine. A slave, slave camp, mine. if yeah. you will. To do hard work, which she's been there for a year. That was the other thing. I found one of the stuff that she was there for four months. I was like, I don't think that's right either. <laughs> she was there for a Did year. Did these people even read the book? Yeah, they read, they read somebody else's synopsis. <laughs> but, yeah, I, mean, I think that's a pretty big thing. I and mean, that's what she's working for, right? That's her whole problem she that's what she's here for any Mm -hmm. thoughts on the freedom side of that um i mean this is like the biggest thing in selena's life right now she desperately wants to be out of these this mine she at one point she um she tries to escape the mine she gets really close most people it's said that they get a couple feet before the guards end up capturing them killing them Mm um in a what a couple hundred feet to the wall oh, they gave the exact it was yeah. like 280 feet or exact. something it's, i had someone it's measure. a long distance to this wall and, and selena made it within inches feet. of yeah. the wall she, she touched the wall she, exactly she almost made it out and she killed like 28 guards or something yeah. so selena is a badass and we found out that at the time she was really doing that almost as a suicide run she's like i'm done and she she just knew goes she wasn't it. making it out, and she didn't care who she took out on the way. Mm-hmm. And yet, they didn't kill her. It's true. It was very true. A little surprising, I'd say. A little surprising. Something special about that Selena. Yeah. So I definitely think that's a lot of what motivates her into putting the effort she does into this competition and dealing with some of the people that are around her, because we learn a lot about the strategy that they're going with. She's in her mind and in many people's minds extremely overpowered for this and they want her to play this middle ground which we'll get into but she is motivated to win because she feels like that's her only chance at freedom and survival overall exactly and you see her go from this this low place when she's in the mine trying to basically get herself killed by the guards there's a gnat flying around and not I anymore just got it not anymore <laughs> So she's trying to basically suicide by guard, and so she's at this low, low place, and all of a sudden she's given an opportunity to potentially win back her freedom, and she is <laughs> she's gung ho about killing those gnats and earning her freedom. <laughs> Absolutely. So the person that comes in to present her with the opportunity of freedom is Prince Dorian Havil- Havilyard, right, the king's son, and he shows up at this slave mining camp to present her with this opportunity to be to win her fr- a chance at her freedom yes represent me in my father's competition and if you win glory you'll be, is yours you'll be free after six years of service four years of service originally it's six she talks him Shit. down okay she she haggles which she hasn't completely lost her spirit is my point like even though she's been broken and beaten down there's still there's still some feistiness in her, right? It, and the fact that she's able to talk him down when she's really got nothing to bargain with here. He has come to her with this opportunity, and he he doesn't really need her. I mean, I think he, he, believes, he kind of does. He believes that she's a good, a great candidate for this, even though she's in like the worst health condition state she's probably ever been in in her life but probably extremely malnourished at this point and skin and bones yeah mistreated definitely definitely but i think it goes it says a lot about selena that she's still able to convince him that no you're gonna give me four years not six Mm -hmm. like he didn't have to agree oh yeah absolutely (laughs) he could have been like It'll be six, and she would have had to go with... I mean, she's not going to... She's very persuasive. She is very persuasive. 
So our next theme we have is good and evil. Okay. What are your what do you think the biggest things to talk about with good and evil are here? I feel like there's a lot of evil that's behind the scenes almost. Yeah. Like there's a lot going on that we don't know about until, like, explicitly until the very end and you kind of get these hints at something greater in the world that's going on that you know, maybe not everything is as it seems, and some people might not be doing things of their own volition, perhaps. There's a lot of, uh... String pulling. Yes. Yeah. People are taking advantage of others. Absolutely. And, I mean, obviously, we've read the whole book, and if you're at this point, hopefully you have to go read the book. That are you're going to be extremely spoiled yeah. by the end of this conversation. It's kind of hard to have a whole book conversation <laughs> without talking about the whole book. Uh, so, warning. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> I guess maybe we should put an official spoilers ahead when you're talking about the entire book. We'll know for next time. Um, but at the very end, like you said, we get to this conversation, which I think is one of the most important conversations in the whole book. And it comes within the last couple, it's like the second to last scene overall. In in the end, but yeah. it's the king and Duke Parrington, yes. right? And they're basically talking about how they're going to have to deal with the things that have happened and how they've essentially been pulling the strings using the magic that they've completely... That they've banned throughout the entire kingdom. Yeah, well, I mean, if you have an ability, how do you make sure yours is the best? You make sure no one else can use it, right? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty pretty strong hand, uh, strong fist uh, way of gaining control and keeping it, right? And I just thought the conversation between them where you find out that Lady Caltain is just being used as a puppet, even though we're in her perspective often, and she yes. feels like she is just pulling string after string, and, and she, she is so in control. And she just wants to be with Dory's oh, Dory. sweetheart. I want, the I want to be the prince's girlfriend. I want to have his babies. <laughs> He's so beautiful. Oh, I, I like Sansa <laughs> Stark, but it's a very young Sansa feel to it, right? I mean, it's, it is. <laughs> it's very much the Sansa that people fucking hate. <laughs> Like that's want, Caltain. That's my Joffrey. I want to have his babies. Now, granted, Dorian isn't nearly as awful as Joffrey, so I mean, that's she's true. not quite as misguided. It's that more matter. of it's okay. So Lady Caltain is definitely not exactly like Sansa at all no. because she is coming. Sansa's coming from a naivete standpoint, where Caltain's coming from a very manipulative, very controlling, wanting a chance at ambition and having a chance at the throne. Right? She wants to be queen. And, I mean, so many choices have been made for her. I feel like she thinks that if she can become the queen, the eventual queen, she'll be able to make her own decisions. Mm -hmm. She won't have to listen to anyone gonna, else. I guess more like Cersei. Yeah. If we're going to go, if we're going to, it's going to be hard not to pull comparisons to other characters, especially on this channel. Game of Thrones, Throne of Glass. Hey, it's the same thing, right? Entirely not related. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, getting back to the good and evil thing, Caltain was a... Definitely, a, in from what we learn throughout the book, she's an instigator on certain things. Mm -hmm. But then we find out that they're she's not even uh, she's not even in control of she herself. Has, she's being played <laughs> like the puppet, and she, which is a, a nice twist. But the king is consistently called a tyrant. He's just terrible, like almost like just the normal world. Terrible, not necessarily like magically evil. Even though it sounds like he might have some abilities, but it's. It's very tyrannical. It's very invading others because he wants to conquer all of the countries. My way done. or the highway. And they're using this tournament to basically find an assassin to, to, to go do the king's bidding without the king's name attached to it. Right, right. Basically, the only people that know that this tournament is even going on are the king's closest confidants who all had to bring a champion to the competition. Right, and it was kind of a secret competition, too, mm -hmm. which is interesting. But I guess another really big player on the evil side would be Kane. Mm -hmm. Kane, who is, we'll, we'll call him, I don't know, big macho head. <laughs> I mean, he, he's the brute. He's a big meathead. <laughs> he's a big meathead. And he was clearly pointed out as the number one competition by Selena when she first shows up. He's the instigator on all of these things we find out he is the one responsible for killing all a bunch of the other uh champions, wiping out the competition competition members and he's doing it by 
pretty evil, like magically evil, nefarious means, right? Mm-hmm. So what's he what's he actually doing? Because parts of it are a little confusing. So he is basically letting a demon, I guess, mm-hmm. into the realm, opening up a portal for a demon to come in, and then the demon is then killing the competitors. Right. Cain disables them, I guess, if you will. Oh, in okay. In some aspects. In some time. Yeah. That, he, he's, uh... There was one where he cut the guy's ankle so, so they he couldn't, couldn't get leave. away. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And that was his friend, too. That was the one that he was, like, buddy-buddy with for a while. I forget his name, but oh. it was, like, they, I don't know. There were a lot of names that, <laughs> in all honesty, never really mattered. If I'm being completely honest, there yeah. were a lot of worthless characters. Sacrificial hams, if you will. <laughs> there were a ton of them. But, yeah, so Cain is facilitating the murder of his competitors via demon Mm -hmm. and is he doing this of his own accord do we really get he seems to also have a really deep knowledge of things he he knows things he shouldn't yeah because there's a a scene where he's fighting with selena in the very end Mm -hmm. the big climactic Uh, duel the the final challenge of this competition and he's fighting with selena he says something to her that really bothers her that she said no one could know that no um basically right. that you know how did it feel to wake up between your dead parents mm-hmm. covered in blood exactly and as far as selena knows no one knows who her parents are she doesn't know who her parents are mm-hmm. she remembers what they look like exactly That's about it they died i think she was nine years old eight or nine young yeah. um yeah. But so it just rubs her the wrong way. And she, at that point, kind of feels that he needs to die to take whatever else information he knows to the grave with him. Right. Yeah. And he's he's an interesting character because it seemed like, yeah, he was just a jerk. And then he got, it seemed like he got a little dirt on Selena because he was the first person to call her out as not being Lillian the jewel thief who is the character she's playing so that because everyone's afraid if they know it's selena sardopian this world famous assassin which if you're a world famous assassin you're not doing it right but (laughs) um like they're basically giving her this moniker to keep her under the radar and play that middle game like we were talking about well and so she can stay in the castle without the rest of the people in the Being castle yeah. knowing who she is and that there's potentially something going on in the castle with this competition. Yeah, which is the other thing. It's like, who gets to know and who doesn't? It... Well, and whose bright idea is it to bring 24, like, thieves and murderers <laughs> into the castle? Assassins and brutes. <laughs> and... Yeah. And we'll just give them a lot of guards. Oh, that'd be fine. But then we'll give them access to weapons because they have to train. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. It needs to be, it needs to be entertaining. <laughs> you know, the king... I could... Not the brightest yeah. guy. <laughs> so Kane, pretty big evil character. Um, anybody else on the evil side? I think that's the biggest ones. Yeah. Overall. King, Parrington, Caltain, kind of, and Kane. Right. And I mean, I feel like those all and the... go together. Yeah. They're all one troop of evil, we find out yes. towards the end. And that's where it seems like Parrington... Because Kane was Parrington's champion. Yes. So... Some of that was them in cahoots, but some of it seemed like Cain was doing his own thing. So I don't know. We just don't have well, that perspective. And it could be that they gave Cain the tools to kind of do some of the things that sure. he did. And he, he just rogue. went rogue and said, no, I'm going to kill people left and right and do what I want and become the champion and drop my mic. <laughs> yeah. It was also interesting that he was doing some kind of vampiric power suck of the other champions every time he would eliminate one of the competitors and kill them he would gain their power yes. and selena just thought it was oh he's training a lot but he starts getting like abnormally huge and also abnormally fast when she finally fights him he, she's like especially for his size right she there's there was some where she thinks to herself like you her. know there's no way that he's gonna possibly get at me this fast mm-hmm. and holy crap he did right and well even like the climbing challenge and the running the very first one of course he was first in like every single thing so i mean if you're winning even those agility type things and speed endurance things it's not just raw strength that's a totally different skill set 
on the good side, obviously we've got Selena and Kale, who is her trainer more yes, than anything, the, the uh, captain the, of the guard. Exactly. And they seem pretty good. Mm-hmm. They they seem like the genuine just trying to do the right thing, trying to get through this. I I would absolutely throw Dorian in Dorian, there as well. Dorian, absolutely. He's got good intentions. He, you know, he doesn't want to be his father by any means. Right. It's because they all like books. That's that's the main thread between those three. They like books. You know, books are the most dangerous weapon. That's true. Selena says it. I was going to say, that is in the book. <laughs> they say that. Well, because she said they, she eventually gets, well, pretty, almost immediately gets access to this library, which is enormous. Uh, basically, the king and prince's personal library. Right, with over a million books. Yes, that no one reads. And there are no guards in there. And Selena's like, why are there no guards in here? And Kale's like, Books aren't dangerous, <laughs> which was like one of his dumbest things he says. <laughs> Especially for how smart he is. Yeah, comparatively, that was his one of his dumbest lines. But she's like, "Well, that's completely incorrect. Like, <laughs> these are probably the most dangerous things in Ideas. in the castle." Yeah, and I like that they worked that theme mm-hmm. in there at least. So those are kind of the the normal person good. People. Oh, you are missing one epically good person. I would say those are the normal <laughs> level. Or who am I missing? Nahalia. I'm getting her. Okay. She's the next rung up. Okay, she's like yeah. uber good. Princess Nahemia, uh from Elway, John Elway, not John Elway, <laughs> but who is a visiting foreign princess who's here to learn the customs of Aurelia? Uh, Aurelia. Aurelia. And... She's there trying to, basically, Elway is likely going to be invaded sometime soon by the king. It's just like the next cherry to pick off the tree in his mind. So she's there to kind of learn the customs and try to maybe barter some in-between working, right? Yes. And she befriends Selena right away. I mean, it, under false pretenses. Yes. She befriends Lillian. I should be clear on that. And, and Kale is very adamantly against. Like, you you should cannot not. be friends with her. Stop talking to mm-hmm. her. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. They end up being besties, right? BFFs. Yes. And we learn a lot more about Nehemia over time. She ends up being probably the most valuable character in the book. Yeah. To Selena specifically. Yeah. She basically saves her life multiple times over apparently like, like tons like of times. she's got some weird magic she can do that's counteracting kane's magic that he's been trying to mm-hmm. do well she has these word marks right yes. she her family is rune yeah. symbols if you will yeah and that's one big thing that selena observes around the castle and near the dead bodies and things and yes. which I actually just realized some of those were probably Nehemia putting down after she while she was taking out the beast when it was it wasn't I don't think Kale was doing it could have been it, it could have been it could have been a little bit of both anyway I, I just <laughs> just had a had little a, light a bulb thing. go on yeah I just had a thing but um Nehemia is, is very well versed she's still learning but pretty well versed in these word marks which combat what kane's doing and also she uses them to protect selena yes by putting these marks underneath her underneath uh selena's bed which selena realizes like thinks that somebody's doing this to come after her and she keeps <laughs> erasing them <laughs> which oh i love uh, that line when yeah. at the very this is the, like the one of the again the yeah. very after very end kane has died and nehemia and selena are talking about all the things that happen in this final competition mm-hmm. Um, Selena gets a little bit of divine intervention, if you will, during this That's competition. That's the next character we're getting to, for yes. sure. But um, there's a line where Nehemia is like, yeah, I was the one putting those symbols underneath your bed to save you. Do you know how exhausting it was having to keep redrawing them <laughs> when you every time? You... Oh, it was great. It was. I like that part. Selena, you idiot. <laughs> like, there are times where it's like, just fucking tell me then. Like, just say something. Like, what's... If we're such good friends. If we're such good friends. You got mad at me for not trusting you, but where, where's the two-way street, man? <laughs> so, Nehemia, awesome. 
Yes. For Selena, the under unsung hero for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, the final, I would say, elite good <laughs> character is the old old queen yes. that arrives to Selena in a vision, whose name is Elena. Yes, Queen Elena, who is half human, half Fey. She's got Fey heritage, which comes into play. I think that's a big part of why she can do some of the magic things that she do does, where it kind of crosses dimensions and almost like a ghost of herself. Yeah, sort a, of some like some sort vision. of echo. So she's Tom Riddle out of the out of the diary. Yes, that's that, I just solved it. There it is. Yep, there it is. We can close this case. Move on to the next book. <laughs> so, Queen Elena. I know we're really going on this good and evil topic a lot, but I think it covers a lot of the character introductions, mm-hmm. right? So she shows up, gives Selena this medallion, which is also kind of long-term saving her from nightmares that she was having, at least, it seemed like it helped her. It's it giving like it, her a level a level of protection. Yeah, we, of we some sort. We don't know how or why or what specifically, but this medallion necklace that she's given her is it's helping her. Yeah, in some way. And she ends up losing it at the last battle, but getting it back. And Dorian recognizes it without realizing he recognizes it. He's like, I think it looks kind of like the one you're wearing. This old story fairy tale (laughs) necklace. But um, she ends up, again, in that very last battle duel between Selena and Cain. Selena is poisoned, Bloodbane. Before just the, yes, just before the battle starts. If just a small dose, just enough to give her hallucinations and make her sluggish, for basically so it's easier for Cain to kill her. Which even Caltain was like, "Isn't Cain gonna be good enough to beat him?" But hey, well, hedge your bets, right? Yeah, I mean he's been sucking everyone else's power by killing them this far. Like, right. If you still can't beat Selena, maybe that's the one you need. Then like. Yeah. Yeah, I don't understand. But she goes and into like, this... how awesome is Selena that she can basically still kick this guy's butt, <laughs> even after he's sucked so many people's power that's into true. himself. Like... Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. And so this this poison gets it leeches into her right, and she starts hallucinating um, after struggling a little bit in the fight and getting her butt kicked, and then she kind of goes into this other reality of sorts it's almost like a different i almost think of it as like a dream a bit but it was like the real actual hap the reality yeah that was like going things on. were still happening and she was still active in them i don't know i guess kind of like the darkness came over the world and she saw things in a new so, new way that she didn't see before that were still going on while she it's like a veil was taken off of her eyes. Uh, like a, Basically, the reality veil was taken off and you start seeing the magic world or the real... The glamour action. of the world went away. She went, she went into the Matrix, right? And <laughs> she started seeing the ones and zeros a little bit, right? Where she starts seeing Kane as a this incredible monster almost demon like you know he's got like these doesn't he have black eyes at one point yep yep, uh burning eyes yes burning amber eyes but they're very very dark Mm -hmm. and he's got these giant teeth that are almost too big for his mouth which could be weird or could be really intimidating (laughs) i don't know um so he he's very demonic looking and he's got this like army of the dead thing going on like with literally an army of dead people that are surrounding surrounding bolstering him yeah it sounded like they were getting ready to attack but hey luckily we get a little bit of a deus ex machina where uh (laughs) queen elena comes in and she can't she can't interfere necessarily or give selena any power but she can suck all the poison out of her which and heck that's just as good <laughs> yeah which was funny because we we listened to that part together on the way on the drive up here today and i was like well that is like exactly the prescription that's, the... <laughs> that's... thanks doc <laughs> that's exactly what i need right now and i'm making noise uh, unacceptable <laughs> so again at the end of the day queen elena big powerful player with a lot of magic, probably the most magic going on. Her and Nehemia have the most good magic going on, yes. and we don't really know how any of it works. No. But we'll find out. 
I hope so. Yes. Okay. There are things to be found out. <laughs> next book. Uh, next next year, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> All right, so Keep our, your eye on that list. Yes. yes. <laughs> our next theme we have is feminism and confidence. Okay. So what what were you thinking when you put this on our list? So obviously we have a very strong, confident, cocky, a oh. young lady. Selena is constantly described as like swaggering and yeah, she's hot shit and she knows it. She thinks she is <laughs> for sure. I don't know if we ever see the proof well enough. That I have some issues with the timeline of how you become this notorious assassin before you're 17. <laughs> like, I don't want to get to that timeline because I don't know if it makes sense. I'm not going to say anything because I know. Okay. But <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. It just seems, it's a big leap for me <laughs> for her to be so world notorious. famous. Like it's, it, oh, everyone's heard of her. Would I, would I have heard of your name when you went in over? Yeah, everyone heard. Thanks. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I'm okay with her being cocky. I loved, I loved her confidence for yes. sure. It was more the believability of. <laughs> Is she really this the notoriety? Hot shit assassin? It was, no, and and even that I was okay with. It was just the notoriety that went with it. I that. The marketing. Well, and it's like all... it's like you mentioned earlier. If you're this great assassin, you... shouldn't people not know? I mean, who obviously you she are? got caught, so maybe she had a calling card that they knew was always her on all of these. But she left a Joker everywhere she went. A jack of spades. <laughs> <laughs> but so but that over... wouldn't surprise me. No, that wouldn't surprise me at all. I think feminism is pretty prevalent through the the way she is portrayed in not having she's not afraid of anybody here she is not afraid to be herself mm -hmm. who is incredibly strong and that's what she's good at and she doesn't take shit from anybody i mean she's a really strong female character i would say she is loyal to a fault and i yes. think we kind of see it here. We absolutely see it later. Um, she stands up for those she loves. And she will do anything for them. Mm -hmm. I can see that. And so, I, yeah, I mean, in a little bit of back reading that I did, um, I found out that this book is very loosely, at least inspired by... Cinderella, which I was surprised to hear. <laughs> it sounded like in a lot of the very loose, very loose. <laughs> like the only thing I could say is, well, there's a there's castle a girl made of glass <laughs> instead of a slipper, <laughs> right? And she says to the dog that I'm going to turn you into a pair of slippers at one point. It's like there were that was very slim, uh, <laughs> which I thought was odd. But anyway. Um, I, I do think she is an interesting character, and obviously she matches up with all of these highly skilled men in these highly masculine activities, mm -hmm. right? I mean, archery, running, tracking, yeah, none of which I mean, we see. There's a few women that start this competition, or is so. it just? I Selena? think it's all men. I think it's. I think she's the only woman. Yeah, I'm not sure. I blitzed through the beginning of this, mm -hmm. and it's been a long time since I've like fully read through it all. Um, but yeah, she stands out and holds her own, and she doesn't take anything, any shit. Mm -hmm. She also has a lot of feminine qualities too, right? Oh, she loves getting dressed up. She loves and going shopping. On her makeup and... Don't get me started on the candy scene. Uh, oh my god. I thought that was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Not that no, no, like she's a girly girl, but she she's not afraid to get down and dirty and do what needs to be done. Yeah. Did you think there was any discontinuity in character with how how feminine we see her when we are consistently sold on the fact that she's this 
hyper assassin, which you think should be incredibly cold. I mean, matter of fact, this is what I'm doing. I don't know. Like it, there were parts of me that were like, man, this just doesn't seem like that could be the same person. Which maybe that's the depth of character. I think she's able to just kind of turn off that part of herself when she's doing her job and just you know i've got something that needs to be done and it's paying the bills for the shopping that i want to go do (laughs) yeah i I can see that Uh, yeah i don't know yeah i think yeah i think it's great depth that you know just because she's an assassin she doesn't have to be this you know manly yeah, I don't even think it needs to be made. I just cold. Like, nothing. It, she's which very, isn't very interesting to read about. No, but she's very charming and gregarious, outgoing, which I could see how that might not fit with an assassin. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the thing, where we get a lot of, oh, I love going to parties. It's like, I don't know. I, I'm not saying, hey, <laughs> you can't. I'm just a little surprised at how overexcited she seems and it's like I mean, a at consistent the same time, thing that could be like part of her cover you know she's going out and doing these things and oh no i didn't kill anyone i was out at a party last night <laughs> yeah it could be so i definitely think there's a, a strong confidence to her right i mean that's kind of goes without saying yeah. so next we're going to talk about some romance and some friendship Okay. The romance. We've got the dreaded thing I hate so much in a book. Oh, I'm a big fan. Love triangles. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, Selena is one point of our triangle here. We've also got Prince Dorian and Lord Kale. Kale Westfall. Such a name. It's a good name. He should be a news anchor. <laughs> That's what that name means I'm to me. I'm Ron Burgundy. And I'm Kale, Kale Westfall. Westfall. <laughs> uh, he's got the gruff demeanor for it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like Kale. I, I do. The The Dorian side of it bothered me more than anything. Like, I get it. How easy it was for Dorian to be swayed by Selena's charm. And the same thing, like, it goes the other way, too. Like... All you like about him is he's pretty. And he <laughs> reads books. With that? And he plays pool. It's like, like the perfect guy. Pretty books. I mean, I, I'm right here, babe. I <laughs> I mean, I get it. That's why I'm here. But I feel like I have other things to offer. <laughs> he's got money, though. Huh? But I mean, I can still appreciate that you're pretty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, and I'm fine with that. But she also thinks that Kale's really handsome and she also thinks that Kane is handsome at, uh, from time to time and yeah. it's just like a consistent thing it's like all these guys are good looking yeah she's got low standards <laughs> I, I don't know to me it was Dorian wasn't that deep he also stalks her a bit <laughs> which I found a little disconcerting <laughs> did you notice that where he's like I was watching I, I came into her room and watched her conveniently sleep conveniently there a lot. Yeah. Where, like, Kale, that's kind of his job. Exactly. Like, like, he's been he's tasked with her. making sure that she doesn't get into trouble and that she's and he's trained. And he's guard. <laughs> he's the captain of guard. It's literally his job. Yes. Like, job number one is captain of the guard. Guard. <laughs> like, keep an eye on things. Be there. Be around. Be present. But no, Dorian constantly is finding ways to insert himself places. Uh... Or... <laughs> Did he? Did he not? <laughs> I don't know. It was a little open ended, wasn't it? It it was implied that maybe there was some physical happenings going on. Yeah. This isn't even empty. I know. Well, that was I finished it because of the romance topic. <laughs> Let's continue. So obviously, yeah, there's there's a romance aspect to this book. Um, I would say it's a pretty strong presence. It goes into all of Lady Caltain's motivation. I mean, oh it's, Dorian, I want well, to be the queen. Yeah, there the romance mixed with romance used for ambition's sake, I should say. But she's probably also really interested in Dorian because he's so he's, handsome. He's so pretty. Oh my gosh, <laughs> which is fine. Like I'm, I'm, 
I don't hate him for that. It's just that's I don't the know, only. Kind of sounds like you that's do. That's the only characteristic we get from him. That <laughs> he's read a book, <laughs> like a book. But At least seven. He gives her seven to read. You know, and Selena tries to convince him to read some naughty books, and <sighs> she tries to get both I Kale like that and Dorian, and they both basically tell her, "You read the no. smut. <laughs> like, Keep no. your naughty books to yourself, woman." <laughs> She does say, you know, if you do read it, maybe you'll get some ideas for your lady friends. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a little smut. <laughs> Except for it's not good to read. <laughs> no, it's awful <laughs> literature, <laughs> but, but yeah. it's entertaining. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's fair. I, it's not my cup of tea, but that's okay. Is I mean, it? I, it has it has its place in stories. I, because a lot of stories you read that are fantasy or sci-fi... It's just ignored. I mean, Lord of the Rings, it is not a thing. There is very, very minor subtext for, like, two characters. A kiss? <laughs> right. Like, or, like, oh, Aragorn has this necklace. You won't know what it's about until the very end, where, oh, he was also in love with Liv Tyler the whole time. <laughs> Aragorn and Liv Tyler go I, way back. You know, that's a really good point that you make about um, fantasy novels in general. Like, you've either got strictly adventure and things going on which is fine or you've got like extremely smutty fantasy like I there know. is no in between for like the there's some healthy romance but explicit sex scenes yeah. every chapter <laughs> i was gonna say like game of thrones has some of that but it also has some of the really explicit stuff too. yeah i mean that it game of a song of ice and fire is it's a wide breadth. You haven't fully read all the books right, on yeah. that, but novel wise, it covers like such a wide variety of people mm -hmm. and relationships that it's it kind of fits every category. It might be that middle ground. Yeah, well, just because it hits the middle ground and then it also does the extremes. Like it just does all of it. Right. But yeah, then like Lord of the Rings, it's very little. Things like this or Sarah's other book that I've read, the A Court of Thorns and Roses series. A little bit more uh, it gets a heavier very on the risque. romance. Yeah, which I... It's just not for me. Like, and I think most... It, to this point, most fantasy novels have been written more for male readers. Which I think is fair to say. And I'm a pretty standard white dude. <laughs> I just am. And I just don't need it in my books, necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably why it hasn't been in there much. So then... When you finally get one, it's either not enough for the people who've been looking for it, or it's like, wait, we gotta just like hit well, this that is card. Like super naughty. Yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm hopefully through this podcast, we're gonna find other books and book series that deal with that because I, I think relationships are one of the driving factors of human life, right? And if you have characters without actual human interactions and human feelings. A lot of times it can fall flat, and it gives a lot of context on, hey, this is what I like about this person. And triangles can be okay to an extent, but it just doesn't need to happen in every fucking book. There Agreed. are better, there are other ways to develop tension in relationships. Yes. Than, oh, I also like this other guy. <laughs> And I'm gonna leave you. Like, and no, it's unrealistic. That, like it's it's awful. Too. If you took a sampling of books in any genre, love triangles happen left and right in the real world. Oh, <laughs> Apparently, man. yeah, no, absolutely. And it's just like it. It, it seems like it feeds cheating culture. Yeah, right? I to mean, an extent, and lack of loyalty. Where mm -hmm. it's like, no, I. This is well, the one I, I want. Can't help it. Then fucking help it, like. <laughs> I don't, let's let's not dwell on that because that oh man that's an entirely different podcast yeah it's that's called twilight uh, Ugh, it's rough so, so the other part of of this uh friendships. Of this thought friendships this series as a whole has so many great friendships okay and people who like selena would go to the ends of the earth for the people that they love and care mm -hmm. about and I feel like we get that a lot with Kale and Dorian. Yeah. Kale is absolutely Dorian's ride or die. Yes. He 
That's his person. He's trying to urge him to make good life choices. <laughs> he is like, just really, like, as, your, as, your, as your pal. Selena. Just avoid the assassin that you hired to do this competition for you. Stop talking like, to her. Don't get involved. Stop sneaking into her room. It, it truly. Stop egging her on. I feel like Kaol is doing that for 90% of the book as genuinely his friend. It's not like a, oh, I look at you as competition. It's not, yeah, he's just like, this is not good this for is just, you as a person. It's just like, bro, You no. as a heir to the throne. And you as a, don't date the assassin. <laughs> like, <laughs> She'll stab you in the back. Or the front. <laughs> over and over We don't again. know. <laughs> it's just interesting. Yeah, so Kale and Dorian are definitely one of those. But where we really see the friendship with Selena and, and Nehemia. And we mentioned it earlier. They, for whatever reason, they just click. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And right away, it's it's a little bit of like, oh, girl talk. But not really. It's They're more both of a, the outsider. They are. And uh-huh. they bond on that. And it really, it helps a lot that Selena can speak her native tongue, at least passingly. Uh, yeah, which most other people can't. So they get to have these sassy little girl conversations between each other and no one knows what they're saying. That's right. That's right. It's like they have their own secret language. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very young girlfriend thing to do, right? Yeah. I mean, either writing language or a vocal language if you can if you can do it. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean that's why we learned Hyperlyrian. Wham! Don't ask me. I, I can't do it right now. No, I'd have to out refresh of myself out of on Duolingo. <laughs> <laughs> that was the idea. Duolingo. Check out Hyperlyrian. Yo uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they're great friends and they are consistently protecting each other in their own ways. There's a, there's a part in there where Selena doesn't have information, right? And she thinks, she finds out a little bit more about Nehemia just by accident, almost. She comes across Nehemia in the library late at night thinking that she can't read very well because Selena... Nehemia forced Selena to teach her how to read and speak the language better because she's a she's a good conversationalist and she can kind of speak both languages pretty well. Yes. So Selena finds Nehemia in the library at night reading a very advanced book in we'll call it common tongue. Yes. Or a a, a, English, a, 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 Aralian, a Aralian, and uh we find out that hey, guess what? Nehemia has was no like, issues reading whatsoever. No, it very much reminds me of a couple of things, but the easiest one for people that have listened to any of our podcasts: Harry Potter, when the Bulgarian president was acting like he couldn't speak English for the entire I world. I just thought Cup. it was funny. I just thought it was funny. <laughs> it was very funny. <laughs> it, it's so it's such a great part, and that's literally what Nehemia is doing. The to whole book. Everyone. The whole to everybody. Uh-huh. Except for Selena. Oh, once she finds eventually, out. <laughs> eventually. But before Selena realizes, oh, she could speak English the whole time. And also she's like super awesome magic. Um Selena starts having doubts because she's she finds out a little bit about some disingenuousness, right? And she she questions Nehemia's intentions. Yeah, she, if she she starts thinking good, if Nehemia's the one maybe killing she's people. the one exactly. And the fact it just tears Selena up inside because even before she has it confirmed that it's not Nehemia, it's tearing her up inside to to, to think, have these feelings. To even think of it as a, a possibility. Mm-hmm. And like we've all had that, right? Like someone you love and you're just like Something is off right now. I don't know what it is. Or like, but I'm gonna go to the. I'm gonna go to the worst. Suspicion in the back of your head that like maybe they did do that. Yeah, and, and it's then like, you're like, did I your really mind, just think that? Right, about your mind that? jumps to the worst, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a self preservation thing because if it turns out that you're like, oh, I was already mentally prepared for that to be an option, but oh, they were just planning your surprise birthday party. Like, oh, oh, thank God they weren't cheating. Oh, on me. thank God. <laughs> That girl at Party City, she had all the hats. That was the text to Jenna. Oh, damn, Jenna. <laughs> so, or, oh, that was just the person he literally has to work with every day. <laughs> but, 
like we've all had those two second thoughts where it's like i can't believe i just thought that especially in hindsight like when you find the full story or what are you wearing jake from state farm uh, khakis <laughs> <laughs> that is it's exactly that, that. That is exactly the. That's exactly the feeling. Nice job. That is so perfect. Uh, who are you on the phone with? Jake, Jake. from State Farm. At midnight, really? She takes the phone from him. That's exactly what it's like. Well, and she sounds hideous. Like you know, he's like, uh, I'm just I'm trying, just trying to, to get a better rate on insurance. And she, you know, the wife, and that has to just feel awful right i mean like what does that make that relationship look like but neither here nor there i think another really strong friendship because i viewed it as a friendship almost the entire time was kale and selena obviously they're training partners they're working through things together it's like their closest advisor i wouldn't say hates selena but he's harsh on her he is very skeptical of her very distrustful yeah he you're right it really is a friendship even though he's got all these feelings for her so there are many ways to develop a relationship right one is common interests no matter how far apart no matter the timing common interests most likely you're going to end up friends or at least get along another way is timing right if you're happy to be working together doing something where you're consistently around each other that's a big thing and i think it's proximity so this isn't like technical. This is just no professor of friendship. Professor of friendship <laughs> is to you, professor of friendship. No, I, it, proximity can be a big thing. Like, how many people have you worked with that you don't like, but like you get along because you work together. You have to be mutually beneficial to each other and productive, mm-hmm. and so you end up forming. A different kind of relation a working yeah relationship. it's not even like a true friendship per se but just like a well i like you enough to talk to you every day because i kind of have to. i don't hate you enough to quit <laughs> exactly. we'll get through it like <laughs> how many how many times have that ha- it happens all the time right and so that's kind of what they start off it's like well we just kind of have to make this work because that's what we're doing yeah either we're gonna be awful and miserable this entire time or well i guess we can try and mm-hmm. talk to each other and they really do seem to have almost a brother sister relationship for a long time too because they have like the picking on each other he fucking ribs her all the time like why are you puking and just like why the competition puking? between them and yeah the, well who's gonna be faster mm-hmm. and I, you know i'll beat you around the track usually i feel like it's pretty healthy mm-hmm. every once in a while kale's distrust of her shows up which i think is completely warranted for this notoriety <laughs> she's that an she assassin has, the world's most famous assassin <laughs> but at the end of the day they work it out mm-hmm. and they work pretty effectively together kale comes up with the idea for her to stay in the middle of the pack they go through with that it works out it works out for a while till selena's like no i can't just middle of the pack this anymore like yeah i'm awesome and i need to show it let me shoot all these bullseyes uh, she <laughs> she shoots them just off but then the very last one she's she like, like which is the furthest target no one even came close yeah. to touching the right but and she's like let me just get it right there yep yeah, on the point yeah. so a lot of good friendships. Was it just me or did it feel like their romantic feelings came out of left field? Like all of a sudden yeah. they were hugging and it lingered a little too long. And I and didn't. You know, I saw it coming. Because, yeah, it was very much hinted at, especially at this at the ball, the Yule ball, right? Yule miss. Yule miss ball. <laughs> Not the Yule Ball. Not the Yule Ball. The Yule Miss <laughs> Ball, where that was again, Selena pulling like, oh, but I can't believe you're not taking me to the dance. Anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, the prince is going to be really But then she also just shows up. Go. She also just shows up, and it's not a big deal. Like, it's just fine. Everyone knows who it is, at least the people that are in the know. Yeah, and everyone else is, is like, oh, Lillian, this mysterious Lillian. Yeah. If she was actually, like, nefarious, she would have had a really easy game of killing everybody. Uh, she could if she wanted to. But she didn't. No. But. Because she's good. At the dance, she is there with Kale, 
because he kind of sees her and is like, okay, well. I'm not letting you out of my sight I now. gotta wrangle this situation now. Like, thanks for my night off. Um, and she asks him to dance, right, at some point, And he's like, no. Nope. But then he sees Prince Dorian come up. And then he gets, Kale gets his, like, stiff soldier face on almost he's really charming I'm professional again it, it's very much one of those he acts very differently with her when dorian's around right he very much pulls he on he tries to set the example of like we should not be trusting her we... but then he falls right into it himself right i mean it, to an extent but i don't think he even realizes it i, I think it's very subtle and hinted at that I don't. Yeah, I don't think he realizes he has feelings the way he does, other than a pang of jealousy, or because he knows he'll never be able to compete with Dorian when it really comes down to it, which is bullshit. Because but like, is Dorian ever because gonna Kale's actually interesting? Is, is Dorian ever gonna choose an assassin to be his <laughs> wife? <laughs> right, and so I didn't think it came out of left field. I thought it was pretty well hinted at, and then it was more of a Their okay. Actions just, on it came out of left field. Uh, I don't know. Even then, like it just reminds me of how many how many combative people have you seen end up together? And you're like, really? You guys hated each other, <laughs> but now like it like sometimes. But it works. Sometimes hate is so close to love. It just depends on how you get into it. Like it just depends. Some of my closest friends were like, you guys hated each other. How did you guys get married? But it's worked, you know, and they're. <laughs> perfect now like, they're great but yeah. surprising sometimes yeah well you know dorian walks in on selena and kale hugging hugging and, and he's like and kale is like nope it wasn't me i wasn't touching her <laughs> nothing's going on and selena almost gonna, falls over backwards i'm just gonna fix the situation i'm gonna walk it off it's everybody the pleats. nothing nothing to see here <laughs> it's the pleats oh he definitely had a boner right uh, yeah 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 he's like dorian don't look down <laughs> now that I see it, like, I don't see anything. Ouch. Now that you mention it, <laughs> oh, I still don't see anything. <laughs> uh, uh, so, p- political intrigue and playing the game is so, something we see a lot of. I think so. Caltain, we kind of already talked uh, she, about. She thinks she's playing the game. Mm-hmm. She's playing someone else's game. <laughs> she's being played in a game too yes. and so a lot of that is her trying to get the throne i feel like we've already talked about caltain enough she she's in there a lot she, she really is worthless <laughs> like at least for now she she ends up getting imprisoned where they could have killed her she is the one that is used to put the blood vein poison in selena's ceremonial wine before the duel the final let's duel. get drunk yeah have... and then fight wine for the winners <laughs> okay we both win then all right let's start partying no you guys are gonna fight to the death after this it's gonna be great <laughs> we're gonna get you hammered and then you will fight <laughs> <laughs> so she was used in that i would say that was kind of her epitome of what she actually was useful for <laughs> other than that it was just a little bit of context seeing parrington and feeling like she had a part to play she gets mm-hmm. these headaches which yeah, Parrington out. is absolutely playing the game. Yes. He, from the, from the start with Kane, yep. he chose per- his champion he, wisely. Which was probably the right choice. No, maybe Selena should have died. No, if it that's was, not what If I'm it saying. was a true competition. If it was a true competition, Perhaps. I feel like it would have still come down to those two, from what we were told. Again, a lot of it. Uh, yeah, no magical it, influence. What I think we have a, a, a game, a comp- competition theme too, don't we? I don't know, but yeah, Kane. If he wasn't cheating the entire time, it seems like he still probably would have been the number one contender. Selena has been out of shape in a in a slave mine. Yeah, pickaxes mal- malnourished. Yeah. Not whipped. Yeah, her body's not functioning as Emotionally it should. Emotionally distraught. Like she's not in a good place. No. I wouldn't put my money on her at the start. I mean, I the 
easy thing is to pick the guy that looks like he's literally been trading every single second of his life for this. Hashtag beast mode! Right? Absolutely. <laughs> and it just sucks that... I feel like it almost could have been more interesting if he wasn't specifically the one doing it, but he was benefiting from it kind of thing without realizing yeah, it. Yeah, almost like if Parrington was doing all of it. And he and was just like, Kane okay, just happened yeah, to be I'll, like, take well, the, I'll take this injection or something. Like, I'm not yeah, Or even just like that. some, you know, his competition keeps dying and he's still what he genuinely was right there's no benefit right yeah it just oh well that's just less competition exactly but i probably still would have won it, one different less person book. for me to take <clears throat> out different book but yeah I, I i do think it would have come down to those two for other political intrigue um there's a lot of who is dorian gonna marry right which yeah. is which can be a political thing caltain mm-hmm. takes it as a political thing um, there's all of these eligible bachelorettes in there. Right. That's where I wanted to bring up Dorian's mother, who yeah. I don't remember her name. I honestly don't know I don't if think we it matters. ever get her name. I don't know if we do. I really don't. And The Queen. So the Queen, Dorian's mama. Um Mummy <laughs> Basically gives him a hard time. She plays the mom role, right? She's like, Oh, when are you gonna get married? When are you gonna get married? When are you gonna marry? I'm only nineteen. Yeah, but you're the crown prince. Like, even Selena gives him that treatment, When are you going to get married? You got to have babies. You got to have babies. You got to further oh. the line. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah, typical royal things. When you're in royalty, there's, there's an insurance policy We can't along always with it, have right? Meghan and Harry's going on here. That's, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, What other politics really happen? There's a lot of, like, behind the scenes, like, uh, Nehemia the being rebellion. a spy. Yep, her being a spy and this kind of rebellion that's going on from Elway, El Elliot way. <laughs> right? Because there's, like there's like a Y in there. Yeah. yeah. I, mentally, I've always referred to it as like Elway. Okay. I, I think... honestly couldn't even tell you how they pronounce it in the audio book. And they just it, say Elway. Yeah, I just skip right over all the weird, word, yeah. weird words in my head. I think head. it's E-Y-L-L-W-E. I think. Either way, that's where Princess Nehemia is from. This and, funny country that starts with an E. Yeah, which sounds like it's very hot. Very Dorn-ish is how I always thought about it. When I, Especially because of the accent that the audiobook narrator pulls. It's a bit Spanish, which reminds me of HBO's Game of Thrones for Dorn. But <laughs> we don't like to talk about Dorn because people get all up in that arms about it. But... <coughs> So Nehemia's country, Elue, is apparently subtly rebelling and everyone gets all pissed off when the king goes out and quashes the rebellion by killing like 500 people. It's just 500 people. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> Take it away, Ern. <laughs> Take it away, Ern. Yeah. Oh, I almost bought one of those the other day. <laughs> I mean... You know, killing people is awful. But when it's war. When, you, when you're king... It's war, and it's rebellion, and it's not unexpected. I didn't think it was very unexpected. It was more... We... This is the unfortunate part of wars. We only care because somebody who is directly affected by it is directly involved in our story, right? That's one of the very unfortunate things of the reality of wars. It's pretty easy to ignore. Un- unfortunately until it's right there which until you see it with your own eyes yeah. or you know someone who's affected by it yeah it's like okay well people are dying every day obviously i was being a little facetious with my uh it's only 500 people but that's like the unfortunate side of of the war aspect it's like ongoing thing, it's only right? 500 people until you know one of them that's true yep yeah, that's right and they're just numbers until you know them, right? And anyway, but there's a lot of things that we don't see, I think, that's going on, especially with the rebellion and with uh, just the further invasion of other countries and things, the the stronghold, the strong fist that the king has on everybody, this tyrannical re- rule. And I don't feel like we get enough of that. I would hope, I think we're probably going to get a lot more from the three chapters I've read of book two. <laughs> By accident, over and over again. (laughs) (laughs) 
I feel like we end up getting a little bit more context that we're going to see some more outside of this very localized thing, which is good. I, I like that the story is going to expand and get some more of that, but it's it's definitely a persistent theme throughout the book. I would say mm-hmm. it's there. It's we don't focus on it every minute, but it's definitely going on. So that's good. Yeah. All right, we've got two more themes to hit. We've got mystery and competition. Okay. And we have false assumptions. Okay. Which one would you like to talk about? And pick your poison. Let's do false assumptions. Okay. And so the reason I put this one in here that way, it's a lot of the false assumptions of how do I want to say this? What what was I thinking at the time? <laughs> now a lot I of it can't tell you that. is Selena being portrayed as the assassin right i know i've complained in quotes about her not feeling like an assassin but everyone treating her that way Mm -hmm. right so there's a lot of false assumptions by kale as one the king by caltaine for different reasons the reverse um about selena right there's a lot of these assumptions that people make about her of, oh, she's an assassin. She's just in it to to kill somebody, or she's just in it for her own ends, her own means. And all we find out is she's a normal ass fucking person, right? Like over and over again. That's kind of what know, it turns into. You know, it's almost into. like she's a normal person who's got a job that doesn't define her. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm an accountant, but that's not all I am. It's really not even an important part of what I am. <laughs> I didn't go to school for it. I didn't want to be one, but here I am as an accountant. And I feel like maybe that's kind of Selena. She was thrust into this position as a means of surviving, and it might not have been the thing that she wanted to do, but it was a way to put food on the table and keep herself in this lavish lifestyle of clothing and whatnot that she enjoys. So she went for it, and she was good at it. Mm-hmm. So she was highly trained. I yeah. mean, that's that's what we learn, and yeah, it, it's just it's funny to see how a lot of times people misconstrue who you are because of their false assumptions going into something. Right? I mean, a lot of times conversation falls apart or is lacking because somebody has a preconceived notion of an idea. And there's just some assumptions that go along with that. And then oh, we don't need to talk about this mm-hmm. because they know what we're doing. It is known. Yeah. It, is, it is known. Well, it's like, <laughs> well maybe it's not. Like, yeah. it, you're better off saying it and then getting, getting the yeah, relative Let's just feel. be crystal clear. Right. And communicate. Yeah, until you have, like, the rapport and, like, you know we have combined experiences. I mean, mm-hmm. the more episodes you do of a podcast we did drinks and those things for so long we knew exactly what everyone thought about each scene that happened we could build before on you that. even heard their thoughts <laughs> right well we also have the the deep context to talk about those mm-hmm. things and use them to, to conversate further and i think it's just a common miscommunication problem for false assumptions going into something and people consistently look at selena as this deadly assassin who's clearly selfish who's clearly just a cold-blooded killer which i was complaining about earlier but i I think it does give her some character depth that she's able to overcome and we see from her perspective again she's just a normal a normal 19 year old girl and it's it's pretty impressive to see i think Mm -hmm. And, like, the reverse of that would be Lady Caltaine, how she just sees Lillian, and she's like, oh, you know, who's this? It's it's the exact opposite. She's like, oh, she can't really be competition. And then she finds out that, oh, that's somebody. Does she actually find out that she's Selena Sard? I don't think it is until, like, way, way later. I don't know if she ever does. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe at the very last fight there, because, well, no, Selena whispered that. The second to last fight, I should say. Either way, false assumptions, bad thing. Mm-hmm. Happens all throughout the book, I think. 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, even Selena and, and the, the symbols under her bed that yeah. she's constantly, yep. someone's coming mm-hmm. after me, someone's trying to kill me. Mm-hmm. Nehemia not just saying, hey, I'm trying to protect you, this right. is what I'm doing. Things would have been a lot more simple just, if they just had tell just me. had a conversation. Just tell me. And our last point here, mystery and competition. I feel there's a lot of mystery Surrounding the competition itself, honestly. I mean, we know that the king wants a champion to do his bidding for six years, four years. Um, but no one knows why. You know, it's... Right. It, it, okay, so the king wants someone to be at his beck and call to... Who's highly skilled in a lot of different areas. Yeah. But we don't know what the king's motives are. We don't know what his end game is here maybe he's trying to take out everyone who's ever been against him we don't know yeah i mean it, it definitely seems like hey how do you set up a way to find out if i'm gonna have a go-to guy or gal is what it turns into and how do i make sure that they are actually the best overall candidate for the job it's a big interview yeah. That's what this is, right? And especially that he doesn't want it tied to his name. Right. Because we find out when Selena eventually ends up winning and she's signing the contract that, you know, you will never mention my name in anything that I ask you to go do. <laughs> you will take my name to the grave. Yes. With you. Yeah. I mean. So that right there is the biggest mystery of it all to me. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's pretty fair of what what use is she going to be put to in the future, right? And you know. <laughs> I absolutely know. <laughs> but, yeah, it's it, I guess time will have to tell. Um, then we've got the mystery of select few individuals can use magic. Well, it appears that to the rest of the kingdom, it's been outlawed. No one has mm-hmm. been able to do magic for... It was like 10 years. I don't remember. A exactly. while. It was a while. Um, So what's up with that? And, you know, why is it that these select few are able to do it? What's giving them the power to override the magic ban? Well, yeah. I... Bypass the uh... magic ban? I don't know if I'm fully prepared to get into the magical mechanics of this because I don't have enough context for it, right? And because it was such a subtle thing, it was not subtle, but it was really, very even underused. Really, until the until the end, you didn't know outright. who was doing anything. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the only thing you knew that was magic was okay. We'll say three quarters of the way through the book, you know, Kane's doing some sort of magic because we see him with these word marks. Well, and obviously, we know that Elena is some right. sort of apparition or ghost or some sort of entity non-human something right those are like the two big things that we know about for a healthy portion of the story it isn't until the very end that we find out hey nahimi has been doing magic the whole damn time parrington has been doing magic on caltain the whole time who can also do magic on other people she can influence people's emotions right and Harrington is giving her these headaches because I don't know exactly what he can do, but it seems like he can manipulate how people are feeling to an extent or maybe just their personal feelings. I, I, I just said the same thing two different ways, but I I don't really know exactly. We only get like a, a line about it. I will say, looking back, there's a lot of foreshadowing that's so okay. subtle. Okay. Like, until you finish... The next book, the next two or three books, the the entire series, and then going back and reading it, it's like, oh, that's what that was about. And it was really nice this time to go back and read it and be like, oh, I had no clue that they mentioned that in this Hmm. first book. And that, you know, they laid the seeds really early. So there's a lot of things that if you look closely and pay attention to them, maybe you'll be a little less surprised than I was. Do you think there are things that you can get on a first read? Or do you have to have context moving forward? Because I feel like I've... I mean, I've gone through this book several times. 
I feel like you have to have the future context looking back and then you're like, oh, I know what that is. Yeah. (laughs) I like that. Mm -hmm. I I mean, we're series readers. That's what we do. And it's very subtle and it feels planned. I like that okay. it feels planned. It it's doesn't not a, feel oh, like oh, I it dropped just... something that I could maybe use. Yeah, and you, you know, out of left field, all of a sudden, oh, I need some crazy type of magic. I'm just gonna start this. J.K. Rowling, I love you, but really, some convenient of the... writing. This Turn... doesn't feel convenient. Okay. There's a lot of things that are dropped in the first book that continue throughout the rest of it. All right. The other really big mystery throughout, we find out later on, is who's killing these competitors, right? Like, that's kind of the the mystery. That is the biggest issue in this story. book. Like, what the fuck is going on? And also, why does Selena have to, like, become the detective? Like, can't you just worry about survival a bit? Like, that was a little frustrating to me. Like, I mean, I guess no one else really cares that all of these assassins how does and thieves are... Because like, it... they're assassins and thieves. Let you know, do like the job. world isn't be- isn't any worse off for not having ten more killers in the world. Yeah. To me, that was a little bit like, Selena, stay in your room. <laughs> like, stay in your lane. <laughs> that was stay in your lane. <laughs> very much a feeling that I get from the few books of Sarah J. Moss is, or is it Mass? It, Moss. Moss is. There are these strong female characters that just they don't, have to fucking do something. They don't know when to stop. Which is fine. <laughs> like, if it was, like, a Harry Potter, he does the exact same thing, and we don't say, like, oh, just, we do, I, I say it, Harry, just stay in your damn room. Like, you don't have to be involved just in everything. Just go to school, do your homework. Do the kid stuff for a while. Selena, worry about the tournament. Like, just stay alive. Do your thing. Play it, play it low-key less interesting overall i know because we need to have the visuals and everything and the drama and but the intrigue just you don't have to be involved in everything <laughs> like sometimes it's somebody else's job right mm-hmm. sometimes it is somebody else's job or if it's not it needs to be right kale is he's that's his that's what he's doing you know you've he's only trying. got 10 fingers you can't have them <laughs> in all of the pies there are a lot of good pies though it was a damn, damn fine, fine pies, pies. <laughs> You know that uh, old old farmer maggot down there's got a, a damn fine apple tree. Oh, King Killer, awesome, good stuff. That was our next read on the drive up. Not on this podcast. So that hits. Yet. Not yet. Not yet. We've got another really good series coming up next. Right. We do, which one. we will talk about shortly. Yes. One love for this book. What was the one thing that you absolutely loved? There were there were a lot more than I anticipated. I actually liked this book more the more I reread it. Like on the first time through, it felt very thin. It it did, but the more I read it and could start seeing even foreshadowing within this book of things that were set up and played mm-hmm. out. To meet Nehemia, I really, I just like the way she played her character. I know we were kind of saying like, oh, just tell Selena that you're saving her life literally like every night is what it sounds like. Right. Oh. Oh, fuzzy. Ooh, fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> A fuzzy beer. Uh, not moldy. Not moldy. fuzzy. Fuzzy. Uh, so that's the Dragon's Milk White. Let me know what you think. Smooth, creamy, legendary. Fuzzy. <laughs> Fuzzy. I'm going to write that one this one. <laughs> I need a pen. But Nehemia, I think, like like we said earlier, is to me the, the book MVP. Like, truly. The, Selena is the driver Absolutely. of everything, but Selena would have been dead months and months ago. If it weren't for Nehemia. If it weren't for Nehemia, basically saving her ass and saving everyone over and over again without saying a damn word about it like that's pretty awesome unsung hero and when when she finally drops that final line of it pissed me off it was exhausting it it was exhausting when i had to keep redrawing these damn word marks because she kept erasing i was just like 
I like her. Tell her how it is, Damia. Yeah, she was like, because a lot of people have that false sense of modesty, right? Mm-hmm. And she was just like, she was modest about it, but it was still honest. It was modest, but honest. And, um. Modesty. Modesty. She is a, my, my most. So modest. Mo, my most modest character. <laughs> and I don't know. I just, I liked her. I thought mm-hmm. she played her role well and was interesting. One of the deeper characters. Uh, it was a little convenient. We found out later on, like, oh, she also can do this crazy magic. But it makes sense for her character, especially mm-hmm. when magic is outlawed. And guess what? Nehemia is, like, candidate number one for people that the king would probably try to kill. Like, if it came down, like, a quick execution to... They, they were talking about keeping her hostage. Mm-hmm. And for political reasons. And so it makes sense. I liked her. How about you? What was your one love? Kale's fruitless attempts to get Dorian to listen to him. (laughs) That's pretty good. He tries so hard. Dorian, don't do that. Don't talk to the killer lady. Don't talk (laughs) to the... (laughs) Don't talk to the mean lady. (laughs) It doesn't work, but A for effort, Kale. I I like that, because that was consistent, too. It's like, hey, this is like a... You definitely guys, shouldn't do that. This thing. is like a guy's no. Like, <laughs> we need to we need to get out of here. <laughs> Let's. This is a Cut bad run. idea. This is a bad idea. Yeah, I, yeah I'm with you. <laughs> One thing you hated. I will say there were a handful of things that I didn't overly love. Some of the characterization of Selena is out of nowhere. It it just or it's a little too much or. And maybe it's just because I'm a guy, it's a little too, I don't want to use the word girly, but it's just, it doesn't seem to fit who we find out she is. And and I, the thing that, my, my number one hate is the audiobook narrator. <laughs> and I think a lot of my feelings on that are because, and I, I usually, I've listened to hundreds of audiobooks. Right. And so... I feel like I could be a little critical, <laughs> but I typically don't get pulled out of a book by the narrator. I'm not usually distracted by the person reading it, which is a you know a, a tip of the hat to the people who do it because it's a hard job. I mean, no doubt, it's a lot of acting. You're doing a lot of voices mm-hmm. and you're trying to convey a lot of feelings and emotions all over the place. For everyone, right? You're yeah, trying to dictate voices and emotions, and I mean, your your director. I mean, there's people that are there directing too. I right. I realize that in professional audiobook territory, but you're playing all the characters. You're doing the production yourself, and I just a lot of times I feel like the 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 standard voice of the book narrator itself, not just the person reading, but the narrator has like a really aggressive tone. Like, everything she says in Selena's head is very, like, aggressive forward. And then all of a sudden, it flips to one of these girlier, more feminine aspects. And it's, like, hyper soft. It's, it's like, it's too varied that it throws me off. Cause I will say I noticed that while we were driving because obviously, like, there's a lot of road noise going on Mm -hmm. and when she would do those like really feminine voices it was like i didn't even hear that yeah (laughs) there's too much noise going on outside of this i and i don't want to i mean i I feel bad at being overcritical because i think she does i'm sure she's great she's probably awesome like it just (laughs) took me out of it a couple times where i don't feel like that typically happens it changed the characterization of selena for me a lot i feel like if i would have actually read this book with my eyes instead of my ears i would have felt very differently about her the first time or two through Mm -hmm. just because of the way it was portrayed to me it would be like oh i'm i'm shooting the shit i'm giving you a hard time but also it's oh now i have a really deep emotion like out of nowhere it was just it didn't (laughs) make it it wasn't it didn't line up with how you thought it should have gone no it goes from like a yeah a slapstick oh happy poking fun at each other with kale and then all of a sudden oh but i do like that like 
No, it just didn't. It just didn't work for me. Well, I wish I had better news for you, but I just looked it up, and Elizabeth Evans narrates every last Throne of Glass book. Great, that's fine. <laughs> so get used to it. Yeah, because there's seven more to go. A prequel and six more after this one. <laughs> what was your one hate? Caltaine. Which, I mean, when you get to the end of the book and you find out that she's not doing everything of her own volition, that she's been toyed with this entire time, mm -hmm. I hate her a little bit less. But it just feels like a, a pawn, right? It's like, okay, that's fine. I, I feel bad for her, <laughs> but I still hate her. Oh, yeah. She, she's weak. Very. Mm -hmm. And a crack addict. <laughs> 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 opium opium addict at least yeah so don't do drugs kids <laughs> drugs are bad and good hugs not drugs <laughs> that's right that's right so what are your final thoughts and would you recommend this book final thoughts my my view on this book like i said changed quite a bit with more rereads and i mm -hmm. it from talking to you it sounds like going further into the series gives you more context and or this feels very contrived as a book hey let's have a big competition to show off things that we can do but we also like consistently don't see those things happen we consistently oh there were also three challenges and i did really well to stay in the middle because they were tracking and whatever else that i'm really awesome at but you don't need to see that like to me it really cuts on the adventure side and we had the conversation of romance versus adventure in a fantasy novel but i feel like she cut 80 percent of the action that she could have had out to its detriment to an extent there was still there was still a lot but it just seemed like if she would have done and again this is a first effort this is a first novel Oh, first novel and first in a series and i can definitely see why it got Air on the side of character growth and to be better for a wider audience i guess i mean you maybe. know yeah and again on the I, whole i feel like you know it is young adult new adult it's like right on the cusp of being in between the two this one's a little more young adult than her other series um but you know readers like romance for the most part i feel like that's in the young adult genre maybe having all them feelings yo romance hits well to certain it's, demographics yeah mm -hmm, yeah so i feel I don't like think i was ever in that demographic. <laughs> <laughs> i just yeah so i feel like you know maybe she was trying to cater to well, this is what the readers are going to want, or this is what they typically want, so. That's fair. To to the detriment of the book, absolutely. It could have been much for, better. For all of the plot that happens within this story, we don't see almost any of it. Right. We only see the really big things. And. Which is fine. The consequences of the things that are happening. It's just felt very, there were even times where it's like, oh, and then they had these conversations for an hour where it's like okay well tell us a little bit more the, about it the pacing was very weird it was it was very odd it's like hurry up and wait and then hurry up things happen over the next wait. two weeks or the next two hours and then we just happen to hear a conversation about which, it which again we were reading we were listening to king killer chronicles book two the uh, uh wise man's fear yes. on the way up and there are times where that happens in Patrick Rothfuss's books, too, where it's like, but he also gives you a lot of context. I, I don't know. I just feel like there were a lot of things a little bit better done in that series for skipping over things effectively. Like, the more show but don't tell on page, where it's like, okay, you can fill in the blanks. Because it's, we don't want to get too deep into that book, but it's just written differently. Mm-hmm. And well, and it just feels like a cop out was, sometimes. This, in this was book a debut me. book. Yeah, she's definitely gotten better. I would agree with, with that time. too. I 
I would agree with that with the other books I've read by her. It it gets right because you've only read this one, and then you've read the first three, three. Court of Thorns and Roses books. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, yep. And even in those, I can tell there are certain things that bothered me about this book that have gone away. Right. But there's still other things that I'm just like, it's just not for me. <laughs> Which is fine. <laughs> would I recommend this book? Right now, I'd say no. Having only read this book, and if someone was saying, I need a cool book to read, I would say no. But that doesn't mean I would say don't do it. It's just I would have other ideas if someone was looking to get into fantasy or right. things. But when I get into the series a little bit more, maybe I'll feel differently. It sounds like I probably I, will. Yeah, I think this is a very, like, intro to fantasy for, like, romance fans, you know? Okay. I, it's a bit I, of a bridge. Exactly. I really like the romance aspect of it, but I want to get into fantasy, but I don't want it to be, like, too deep of a fantasy where oh, I'm really sure. confused. You can scare them but, off with yeah. a thousand names. I, Game of Thrones. The oh. first time I tried to read that book, I got three pages into it and had 30 names thrown at me and i'm like yeah they uh, all have deep histories i don't Come know on. who's important <laughs> here i'm just gonna go watch the tv show and then i'll come back to it which is how i recommend reading that which book worked really well yeah because then i'm like okay i know seasons i know who i need to care about and then read all the books but yeah so i mean i can definitely see that this is like your intro to fantasy for a younger person you, you want the new world and maybe the magic and mm -hmm. all of that mesh together, but there's still a lot of romance. And as the series goes on... Does it, it become more fantasy-driven or... Yes. Or just more I mean, th there's still romance to it as oh, it sure. goes on. Um, it wouldn't be a Sarah J. Moss book if there wasn't. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I feel like we get more more background on the world that we're living in and more i don't know there's a lot more mystery that's been the seeds have been laid in this first book that we get further down the line okay um but i mean the first time i read this book peak hunger games like the first movie that very much felt like a Again, like it, a contrived competition, I think it had, right? The first movie had either just come out or was about to come out. Because oh, this book was 2012. August, I believe. Yeah, August um, uh, 4th, I think is what we wrote down. Do, 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 do. August 2nd, 2012. Second. That was my second choice. Um, <laughs> it really was. And at the time, I was working for a Hunger Games website. And the publisher had contacted us, a publisher of Throne of Glass, saying, Hey, do you guys want to read this book for review for your website? So, I read this as it came out. 2012, and, Hunger uh -huh. Games. Yep. And so... March it, 23rd. It was very so much, you know... Three the, months after, four the, months after. The competition with 24 people. Okay. It was, yeah. It was very much like, oh, wow, this is exactly like the Written Hunger Games. Written for but exactly set, that pop But instead of a dystopian period. world, we're in a fantasy world mm -hmm. now. And instead of being someone that's volunteering to save her sister, it's volunteering to save herself because she kind of has to. Well, and not even volunteering, but there were a lot of similarities. She agrees. She agrees. Exactly. Um, There's a lot of similarities. Yeah. There, there was a lot of similarities. And, and Cinderella, too, right? So much Cinderella. Um, but at the time, you know, I was like deep into the world of the Hunger Games, and I was ecstatic that this was similar but i can looking back now i can see yeah okay this this just feels it's a bit cheap yeah easy it convenient. was very easy and convenient and the timing i think was just awful you know that it was just as the movie was starting to come out and so looking back i can see how this book is it's not great it, it's good, but it's not great. It has it lays some really good bones for what comes in the future, um, but I still recommend it. And you know, by the third book, absolutely things get much more mature. I would say that okay. um, feels a little less juvenile. On the authorship, or uh, on... on the story. Okay. Um. So you know. 
stick with it if you're kind of intrigued and it does get better and I love this book and this series. That's why we did it first. Exactly. I was given the the uh, task of choosing the very first book. It was an easy choice for me. And that's, I think, what matters most, right? I mean, obviously, you recommended it to me. And that's why we did this one. So, again, I it just depends on who the audience is as mm -hmm. well. I, I wouldn't recommend it to somebody who has read a lot of fantasy novels. I think when, when you put it in terms of, especially someone coming fantasy from... Fantasy 101. <laughs> either young adult who's not as very not very experienced mm -hmm. in fantasy or is already a romance novel fan even it, this doesn't translate very well from harry potter but that's also like another one like the early early books that people tend to get into so right but coming from that aspect of it i can definitely see how this is a great introduction into a fantasy-esque setting with mm -hmm. Maybe some parts and pieces that you're used to and transitioning into more of the magic and high fantasy it, it world. It definitely gets there. It, it takes a minute, but it gets there. And, yeah, some of the writing is... It, I promise it gets better <laughs> in other things, but it's not terrible. It's not terrible. There's some... Suspend your belief, but that's okay. Yeah. Heroes gotta be heroes, yo. Not everyone wears capes. <laughs> Not everyone just holds the door. <laughs> Too soon. Aww. Well, thank you very much for tuning in to our first episode of the podcast that gets lit. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Gets Lit Podcast. And hitting that like button really does help us out. So be sure to hit the like button. Share us with all of your friends. Show them how much you love us. And we have a sneak preview of our next book that we will be covering. Ooh, yeah. Luke, you want to... Yeah, so this next book is my number one pick. Yes. And a young street thief learns how to go to classy parties and how to wield, a mis how to wield the mysteriously magic powers of allomancy to aid a rebellion against the final empire's tyrannical lord ruler in the final empire mistborn number one by brandon sanderson this show and all of our shows at the podcast that.com are produced with the love and support of our wonderful wonderful imaginary legion patrons you can learn more about our reward tiers and all of the benefits you get from joining the Imaginary Legion at patreon.com slash stayimaginary. Until next time, just keep reading. Stay imaginary. Stay imaginary.